Good evening and welcome everyone to the College of Computing's Tower of Two celebration. As you may all be well aware of by this point in the day, today is Tuesday, 2-22-2022. So, we are excited to celebrate all that the Power of Two means for the college, both from the slightly nerdier side with binary, um, but also the idea of coming together stronger as a community. We're here with Dean Charles Isbell, who's also a Georgia Tech College of Computing alum, in a room of faculty, staff, students, alumni, and friends of the college, and there are many of you joining us online as well. And we're excited to just chat a little about what's going on in the college, things that all of you have to look forward to participating in as part of our community, um, and questions that you as the audience may have. Um, so for those of you who are joining us online, you'll be able to post your questions for Charles using either the chat or the Q&A function. And for those of you in the room, if you have a question when we get to about halfway through the conversation, um, we will have mics moving through so that those of us online um, can also hear us. So Charles, it's good to see you as good always. You, as always. <laughs> it's been what, 18 years of this now? Yes. Yes, I know. All right. Well, why don't you start us off by just kind of highlighting a few things that are happening in the college right now. There's a lot of exciting stuff going on, a lot of things surrounding the number two or the power of two. Um, so I'll turn it over to you. Well, so good evening, everyone. So let me thank you so much for being here, all the people who are in the room and all the people who are online. Um, as Jen said, uh, today is 2-22-22. Um, and it seemed like a really wonderful time to throw a party. For those of you who are listening online or, or hearing this later, we had, a, I think, a really great day. We had breakfast, uh, Waffle House. And, specifically bacon. Specifically bacon. We had Waffle House. We had uh, bacon and, and hash browns. Uh, I had a, a little discussion with some of the, the students. Uh, we had a bunch of giveaways, a lot of games. That was really full. Uh, and... Um, we, are, we had a nice uh, lunch with the faculty and staff, and we're ending the day with a fireside chat. The goal of this uh, is just to give any of you who are interested an opportunity to ask some questions about the college, things that have happened in the past, things that are happening now, and things that are, that are going to go on uh, in the future. And although I'm talking for a little bit now, the point of this is to open it up to any questions, just to hear anything that you have to say, and sort of kick off uh, the celebration for the year of the Power of Two. The power of two is powerful and an important thing to me because one of the big things that we care about in the college is community. And as you all are aware, we have spent the last two years or so, it'll be two years in just a couple of weeks, uh, not being able to be here the way that we were before, not being able to spend time together in person, not being able to be, well, in the community that the college and uh, the university usually provides. And I think that as we're moving closer to a time where we can spend more time together, uh, I wanted to celebrate that possibility and take advantage of all the twos. It also turns out that this year there's a whole bunch of anniversaries. It is the two to the fifth anniversary of the College of Computing, which was founded in 1990, the two to the fourth of the creation of Threads, the two to the third of uh, the creation of OMSCS, and there's a whole bunch of anniversaries uh, that all coincidentally are powers of two for this year. So it just seemed that we, we have to throw a party. We've got another 200 years before we get to 2 22 and I didn't want to wait that long, so I thought we should, <laughs> we should start now. I'm going to open it up for questions. I know that Jen has a few things for me, but just let me tell you a little bit about what's going on. So if you look out around you, any of you who've been here for any period of time, and I see several people who've been here as long as I've been here, uh, the college has changed dramatically. Georgia Tech has changed dramatically. Higher ed has changed dramatically. When I got out in 1990, I think I marched with 20, 30 odd students. Right? The College of Computing is now huge. Uh, we're the, by students, the largest college at Georgia Tech, depending upon exactly how you count. Um, we're as big as engineering for sure. We're completely sure that we're the largest college of computing in the country, probably in the world. Um, and our reputation has grown and exploded in that time. When I was here in the 1980s, we were maybe ranked in the 30s. Rankings had just started then. We're now um, number eight among grad programs, number five among undergraduate programs. We're the only computing unit in the history of rankings of computer science that have moved from the 30s into the 10s and the only one in the last two decades that has moved up in the top 10. 
But beyond that, we have grown, we have exploded. Let me tell you a little bit, a few interesting numbers. So we're now in the middle of the period now where people are um, applying to Georgia Tech and being admitted um, and accepting to come in. About 10 years ago, Georgia Tech got about 15,000 applications total. This year, computer science alone has about 14,000 applications. Three or so years ago, uh, we became the third public university in the history of this country have an acceptance rate below 20%. This year, the acceptance rate for computer science will probably be in single digits, which is a good thing in the sense that there are more and more people who want to be here and to join this community that we've created. And it's a difficult and a challenging thing because we have all of these wonderful people we want to be a part of the community. We can't have be a part of the community because we're limited by physical space and size. Having said that, we've been able to do wonderful things online. Uh, the OMSCS, which is definitely the largest uh, graduate program uh, in the country, now enjoys about 12,000 students. When we first started this eight years ago, we had zero. We have 12,000 students. We accept every student we believe who can succeed, and it turns out that they're doing just as well as their counterparts on campus, which is a promise that we can live up to our motto of progress and service and that we can serve all of the people who are capable of succeeding if given uh, the proper environment. So this community, this thing that we're trying to do is about providing an environment so that we can all work together and accomplish things. I'm gonna leave you with one last statistic. Some of you have heard this before, but to me this says something about the future and something interesting about the power of two. 49% of all of the alum of the College of Computing, including many of you out there listening, 49% of all the alum in the entire history of computer science and related fields at Georgia Tech have graduated in the last five years. That's amazing. That's true because we've experienced exponential growth. Next year, when we're talking, I will tell you that more than half have graduated in the last five years because the numbers continue to grow. That is a massive community of people who are now a part of what we get to experience, the thing that I got to enjoy 30-something odd years ago and the thing that many of you are enjoying now. And my hope is that we'll be able to continue to grow that, keep all the quality and the wonderful things that we've been able to build together and bring more and more people into this community. So that's what this is about. And I think that one way that you build community is you have conversations. So my hope is that we'll get some interesting questions and I'll be able to answer them as best I can. And this will be conversation number zero of multiple conversations that we'll be having over the next several years. So thank you for being here and uh, I hope you enjoy the next 40 minutes or so. Perfect. Well, I always have questions for you, but we're going to start with an audience question. Um, so you and I were both students here, you longer ago than I was, but... Not that much longer. Both... We won't go there. Um, but obviously we are no longer students anymore. Um, but we wouldn't be here without the students. Mm -hmm. As the dean, you do have an advisory board that is made up of industry reps, alumni, friends of the college. Do you have a student advisory board that helps you with understanding what today's generation of students need and want and what's going on in their daily academic and personal lives? So that's a great question. So the answer is both yes and no. So yes, there is an under, particularly an undergraduate um, um, advisory committee of students um, that has sometimes active and sometimes not active. I've met with them many years in the past. Just before um, uh, COVID hit, I had a, a meeting with uh, several representatives um, and then COVID happened and all of the plans that we had for uh, town halls and, and continuing conversations sort of went away. As far as I know, it still exists, but I haven't had conversations with that group this academic year. So I think the answer is yes, but the answer is also no, because undergraduates come, undergraduates go, sometimes they're very active, sometimes they're not, and so sometimes we see um, lots of activity and we have lots of conversations, and some years we don't. I am hoping that going forward with some of the, the efforts that we're having, that we will be able to build that community so that it survives over multiple years, no matter what change in leadership is going on. And of course, I have an open door policy. People can always reach out to me. You, you usually have to get an appointment because who knows whether I'm in the room or not. Uh, but I'm always happy to, to talk uh, to the undergrads. At the graduate level, we have a long history of uh, various graduate organizations who have access to the dean, both my predecessor uh, and to me. Uh, that continues to be the case. Sometimes it's a single 
uh, unified organization. Sometimes it fractures along different degrees, um, but I'm always happy to meet with them as well. And some years we do a lot of wonderful things together, and some years we don't. So I think there's an interesting question that I always ask myself, which is how much um, is up to the students to start the conversation with me, and how much is up to me to have that conversation happen. So yes, lots of organizations that do that, lots of ways to talk to me and to talk to anybody or anyone in the in administration. And no, we don't do enough conversations. Um, so another question is, advancements are being made in the field of AI, which is your specialty. Um, so what is the college's position, let me read, what's the college's position in software advances in co-coders such as GitHub, especially as it applies to academic honesty and plagiarism? Okay, I don't know how those two things. <laughs> yeah, I probably should have read the question in more detail before I asked it. Okay, so but. which question do you want me to ask? <laughs> let's let's go with we're in this virtual world. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have done very well with remote education at the collegiate level oh, yeah. because we have the OMSCS program. But rolling that out to undergrad mm -hmm. students, rolling it out to the masses like we have in the last two two years now, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen like many other universities increases in academic dishonesty, plagiarism, and there's a good and a bad side to technology we're seeing. Sure. What is the college's stance on how does technology fit into, I guess, along the lines of your whole responsible computing, how do we continue to leverage technology and the access that it gives students while maintaining integrity with what we do and how we teach? So the key phrase there is integrity. The key word is integrity, right? The goal of this whole exercise, going and having an education in a place like Georgia Tech or anywhere, um, is to learn how to do things that have an impact in the world. You don't have the kind of impact that all of you want to have if you don't understand what you're doing. Integrity is crucial to what we do. Of the big three strategic uh, goals that I have for this year, one of the biggest ones outside of community is responsibility, responsible computing. Responsibility is not just thinking about privacy or being careful about how you bring people in or what impact you have on the world. Responsibility does, in fact, fundamentally mean integrity. It means that you have a responsibility as a person who's developing a software that's going to touch the world uh, to understand what you're doing and to think hard about those consequences. And there's no way to get around that. There's no way to take, take half measures um, in order to accomplish that. When you're an engineer, um, as say a civil engineer, they tell you, you have to know what you're doing because you're going to build a bridge that people are going to drive over. And if that bridge collapses, people will die. If you're a computationalist, it's far worse than having a bridge collapse. You build a system that gets the wrong person jailed. You build a system that allows um, a group of people to do something terrible to someone else. You build a system that makes the mistake that causes the plane to crash. The consequences of what we do are completely ever-reaching around the world. It isn't possible, it is unethical uh, to go into that without thinking very carefully about those implications and the things that you're learning. So we go through these processes because it puts us in a position where we can be responsible for the things that we do. Having said that, there's a premise in the question that I think is important. There's two. One is a kind of notion of working together and getting information and you know what does it really mean to do uh, computing. And the other has to do with an implication that integrity is going down as opposed to going up or staying the same. So let me address both of those. Uh, I'll start with the, the second one. I think in truth, even with the growth of uh, uh, academic integrity cases that we have seen over the last several years, as a percentage of the total number of students, they haven't really gone up at all. The thing is, N is very large. So even a small number times a large number can still be a large number. I don't yet see evidence uh, that we are, in, uh, we are having an issue with that um, in any fundamental way. We just have more people and it's sort of, as a result, easier to do. And you get to see more. But the change hasn't really happened in the way that I think, that I think people fear. And I think that's sort of important. On the second question, or the first question of what does it mean to be in an environment like this where you can get information at your fingertips and why do I have to know this? I can look it up on Stack Overflow. It's just not true. You have to understand what you're doing. It matters that you know what the halting problem is. It matters that you understand that what you're trying to build is impossible or that what the implications are for what you're doing. It matters when you write the very first for loop you ever write that you think about privacy and you think about security. You have to think about those things from the beginning. You have to build those things in. 
What we do as computationalists is important. What we do as computationalists is a different way of thinking. And you have to internalize that way of thinking so that you can have the kind of impact that you want to have. I don't believe there's anyone in the college or anyone at this university who wants to skate through, come out on the other end, just get a job and not worry about what it is they're doing. I think every single person here believes I believe you're capable of it, and I think you believe that you're capable of doing something really extraordinary if you wish. And in order to do the extraordinary things you want to do, you have to take it seriously and be responsible for what you do. So I don't believe we are in any kind of crisis. I don't believe that um, the numbers support that or the data support it, but I do believe that we have to be very explicit in teaching people and helping them to understand the consequences of the small decisions that they're making along the way and their ability to have a fundamental impact at the end, which is why ethics is not only a requirement at Georgia Tech and in the College of Computing, it is now a requirement before you do junior design so that you're exposed to these ideas and sort of thinking through these consequences early enough in your career so that it impacts the things that you're trying to do as you become a junior and a senior before you go out into the world. So you would say that things like GitHub that allow students to post their code and share code and learn from each other is actually a benefit more than it is a detriment to you? It's, it's a trade-off. It's a, funda it's a fundamental trade-off, and you know, like any other tool, you know, fire keeps you warm or it burns you, and you have to decide whether you just want to be kept warm or if you want to be burned. I do recommend to people that when you put things in GitHub, you don't just make them public so that other people can use them for their own assignments, uh, but uh, generally speaking, I think that on balance, uh, it's good that those things are there, and it's good that we're able to share. Open source exists. All of these things are on net a positive. So let's go with the AI question. I'm going to ask it a little bit differently. But obviously, AI is a big sector of industry right now. Everything is, is moving to this intelligent devices, intelligent, you know, everything in between, machine learning, all that. I know that AI is your specialty. And so you're going to say, of course, it's the most exciting area in computing right now. At least that's my guess. Mm -hmm. But what other areas, in addition to AI, are you most excited to see on the rise in computing? So let me just say up front that AI is the most exciting area and everyone should be doing it. Actually, you do see this in our own students. The most popular of the, of the threads uh, in computing is intelligence by far. That's been true for about four or five years. Almost half of all of our miners take the intelligence thread miner. So clearly, people seem to think that it's important. I get asked this question all the time. How do you bring people into AI? How do you deal with this? How do you teach the chemist that, you know, to use AI? Often they mean machine learning when they say this. Sometimes they mean data science and so on. I think the question of AI and why it's important and the impact it can have, I think the question of cybersecurity and privacy and the impact it can have and how you teach people, actually the same question. It's all computing. It's all about a fundamental way of thinking about information and algorithms and thinking through how models, languages, and machines are equivalent and turning that into sort of actionable things in the world. So for me, you ask about how AI is going to have an impact or what it is we need to do to teach it or to prepare people. You could ask me that of cybersecurity and privacy. You could ask me that of theory. You could ask me that of human centered computing. computing. No matter what you ask me, the answer is the same thing. It is fundamental and central to what everyone does you will not be able to get a degree in history five years from now without understanding computing and thinking that way. By the way, although we are central, and I strongly believe that, does that mean that we are more important? You also need to think like a scientist. You also need to understand trade-offs the way an engineer does. You also need to think about, you need to think critically the way a philosopher makes an argument or the way people in the humanities and in the social sciences think about the world. These are all tools that allow us to solve problems. So, I can talk about AI for 50 minutes, but at the end of the day, it's still fundamentally a way of thinking about dynamic processes and the way they impact data. And that's something everybody needs to know no matter what they're doing. I have strong feelings about this. I know. Um, I'm glad you kept your answer brief, um, or at least brief in Charles' terms. Um, so let's kind of switch gears a little bit. So. When we look at our different populations of students, obviously our undergrad students, they develop community through student organizations by taking general courses, living in dorms, living on campus, all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. PhD students, they have their research labs, their research teams, they're building community around that. The master's level, we have students here for, you know, on the on-campus program, a year, maybe, 18 months. 18 months. Give or take 
with our online masters, we have students anywhere from you know two to six plus yeah. three to six plus years, depending. How do we build community with our master's students in general, given that they are here for typically much shorter time periods than a PhD student or an undergrad student? And how do we bridge the community between our on-campus master's students and our online master's students? Yeah, it's, it's a hard thing. I mean, I, I, I think for the online students, uh, I know because I still teach in the online program, they're brought together by suffering, just like all of us <laughs> are who've gone through Georgia Tech. The big advantage for the online students is there's so many of them. So you can find community locally. When we first started this program, uh, that one in particular, we uh, decided um, to create a few official channels, uh, ways people could communicate with one another, but to give them the technology that they needed to sort of talk to one another. Well, very quickly, they created their own organizations. At one point uh, before Google, they did all this on Google+, because someone had to use Google Plus before it went away. Um, they had at least 53 of these organizations uh, that they created themselves. Some were based on where you happen to live, some were based on interest. Um, they created their own community. And then what we did is we supported that community that they, they wanted to create. Um, and when there's eight to 10 to 12,000 of you, it's, it's, it's much easier to find one or two folks you, you can interact with. So for the online students, I think the main thing is to bring them in. So when I go and I visit with alum uh, in various cities, we invite almost always the OMS students so that they can be a part of that networking, a part of, of meeting everyone, and just discovering how many other people are in the same place that, place that they're in. I think for the undergrads, four years is four to five years is the time that most has been here. Um, it's much easier because the entire university is oriented around making that possible. doesn't mean it's easy. I know people sometimes have a hard time finding friends or figuring out what it is they're doing. You're looking and sort of searching for yourself. The master's students on campus are difficult. There's four or five or eight hundred of them. There's not 12,000 of them. They're only here for typically two years, maybe 18 months, depending upon what they're doing. But the best that I think that we can do on that is to make it clear that they are a part of this community. And that furthermore, the community will exist when they leave. So you're not just a part of the people you interact with now, but the people you're going to be interacting with later. And when you join that community, you will be joining that community forever. Um, there's a guy sitting in the back here uh, who introduced me to third generation of, of Georgia Tech student, right? That's amazing. You know, granddaughter, mother, father, grandfather, right? You can just build that that community is going to last, not just for the 18 months you're here or the four years you're here or the three and a half years you're in OMS or the six, seven, eight years you're getting a PhD. It's going to last literally for generations, right? And if we communicate that and we make it possible for people to connect, the, the rest will follow. So one more question um, from our online audience, and then we'll turn it over to the room. Um, and this is going to be kind of a two-part question. But given COVID-19, the pandemic, and moving to virtual ed education, we obviously did really well. And it, in many ways, kind of ignited the growth of the OMSCS program. Mm -hmm. um, so two-part question. One, what most excites you about what's next with OMSCS? or online education in general? And do you think that this is in some ways the new normal of higher ed? So I don't know if it's the new normal for higher ed. I think though, I tend to think about this not as just being about OMSCS. Um, it's an example. What the biggest impact OMSCS had was proving it could be done and that it could be done with quality and that people were actually interested. What really excited me about it though was that when you looked at the people who uh, were a part of that program initially, um, they looked nothing like the people who were coming on campus. I don't just mean demographically. It turns out that 97% of them, this data is a little old, but 97% of them would have never pursued a degree otherwise, which means that there's all of these people who wanted to reskill or retool or wanted to get a degree or wanted to change career, they wanted to do these things, and they couldn't because they didn't have an option, because they've got mortgages and a family and they live on the other side of the country and they can't stop their lives to, to um, pursue a degree on the other side of the world. But we gave them this opportunity and they succeeded. They're statistically indistinguishable from the people who come on campus and they're statistically indistinguishable from the ones who get out. They're the same, they look the same. So we have all of these qualified people who didn't have an opportunity and now that they do. To me, that's the power of what we've been talking about as online education, is it gives us the ability to reach more people who would have succeeded if only they had had uh, the opportunity. 
We admit something less than 10% of the master's students on campus because the largest room on campus has 348 students who can take that class. It's over there in Scheller. And we just can't admit but so many students. But now we can admit thousands upon thousands upon thousands of students. That's true at the undergrad level. It allows us to multiply our reach and to have people take all those AI and machine learning classes we can't have them come here for. We can make it possible for them to do some of this remotely. So for me, the question is not the online delivery of some you know, lecture that I would have given. It's a way of rethinking our ability to reach people, whether they're physically here or not, and providing and thinking about new ways for allowing people to educate themselves and for us to curate that knowledge that they need so that, so that they can be educated. So I think the change that we're going to be seeing over the next couple of years because of what we think of as online education is going to be a rethinking of the way that we're able to reach people. It's not going to be about being able to do 448 students instead of 348 students. It's a new way of allowing people to, um, to educate themselves and to be a part of the community that allows them to do these great things. And so I'm extremely excited about that. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like outside of not just grad school but, but undergrad education, let me throw some numbers at you. Um, three years ago, four years ago, about four years ago, there are about 600,000 high school students in the state of Georgia, roughly speaking. For those 600,000 students, there are, if I have my numbers right, uh, 15,000 certified Spanish teachers, which by the way turns out to be about the right number. By the way, it's not German teachers, French teachers. Those are just the Spanish teachers alone, the ones who teach Spanish in high school, and it's about the number you need. Three, four years ago, 98 certified CS teachers, K through 12 in Georgia. The number's gone up a little bit but not by the orders of magnitude it would have to be in order to make certain that everyone in the state of Georgia would be able uh, to take uh, computing and be prepared to come to a place like Georgia Tech. So if you were in the state of Georgia and you had computer science in high school, you were one of a very, very lucky few who even had access to that. Well, with technology, um, and just to be clear, if I want to move from 98 to 15,000, that's a 50, 60 year pro That's not a thing that you can do in a month or a year, or even a decade. Just training the people takes forever. So the only way that you're gonna be able to reach people and make them a part of the conversation we need them to be a part of is if you can reach them through technology and multiply the ability of people to educate and to teach and to reach the people who are near them. That's what's exciting about online education. That's what's exciting about the future is that we're gonna have an ability to reach 600,000 people who otherwise would have never had the opportunities that those in this room and those who are listening online have been able to enjoy. I think less than 20 students in the Atlanta Public School System took APCS five years ago. Last year we had 150, right? We can, we're able to have these kind of impacts in a relatively short period of time because of the things that we've been able to learn. The distributed classroom is a, a powerful metaphor and a powerful thing we can do. That's what excites me. So you gave the um, rankings at the beginning of our conversation. Mm -hmm. Undergrad education, we're ranked fifth. The graduate level, we're ranked eighth. I've had this conversation with many alums, so I'm going to ask a question before we jump to the audience again. But you can look at this expansion of us educating people who would never have pursued a computer science degree or taken a computer science course as you know, our community service, our, you know, goodwill towards Atlanta, towards the greater community um, outside of Atlanta. Do you feel that by having online degree programs that can accept as many students that are capable of us succeeding and meet those requirements to get in, does that in any way dilute the reputation of Georgia Tech or does it enhance it? So Do we if, dilute the brand if by you look at a, If you look at the U.S. Bureau, Bureau of... Um, of labor, U.S. Labor Bureau. Uh, they show all the categories of jobs, how many openings there are every year, uh, and then how many graduates, undergrad, masters, and PhD that there are. The only job category where there are more jobs each year than there are graduates is computer science. And it's strongly related fields. So we could triple, we could quintuple, it doesn't matter how many more people uh, we're able, qualified people we're able to put out in the world, we still aren't gonna meet the demand. So if we want, as a country, if we want, as a community, if we want to be able to have enough people out there who are going to have the kind of impact that, that we want to have, we have to educate more of them. 
And frankly, I think Georgia Tech is better suited to do that than any other university I can think of. Um, so no, we can't dilute it because if we did another order of magnitude, we still wouldn't have enough, one. Two, I think it is simply ridiculous to decide that the way that you um, get uh, prestige is by saying no. Your prestige should come from taking people and helping them to be better, or at least doing minimal damage while they're here, right? That's the goal. The goal is to take people, give them the tools they need, and then have them have an impact. I guarantee you that if we admit those people, we give them the opportunity, and they go out in the world and they succeed, which all of you will do, then our reputation will go up. It will not go down. And people will wonder how we're able to do it. And it's because we give people the opportunity they didn't otherwise have. The people who leave OMSCS, 12,000 students, more than most universities have students, are statistically indistinguishable in their performance from the students we admit on campus. So, you know, the only way that we could hurt our reputation is by letting people get out who shouldn't be getting out. But we don't let them in unless we think they can succeed. And they tend to live up to our expectations. So let's go, we've taken a lot of questions from um, our online audience and questions that I had for you. So let's turn it over to our live audience. Um, if you do have a question for Charles, just raise your hand, we'll bring you a mic, that way we can capture that in the online stream. Any, any takers? I got one back there, we got one right there. Sorry if you've already covered this, I got here a little late because I, for some reason, misunderestimated Atlanta traffic. <laughs> so, there's been a big issue in the tech community at large about the, what you could call it, equity of tech. How do you believe that the College of Computing should, well, I guess, first, do you believe that the College of Computing needs to change the way it teaches computer science in order to create, I guess, a more equitable software landscape, let's say. And if you do, how do you think it should be changed? So, well, so the, the question has a premise in it, so let's, let's, let's make the premise, premise clear, which is that we aren't doing this. Um, and the other is that it needs to be done. So let me accept the second one. We, it absolutely needs to be done. And equity, by the way, is not a thing of just um, opportunity. It's a way about designing and thinking from the very beginning how you impact the world. So I've given talks about this. You're all welcome to go to um, conversations.cc.tech.edu and you can see a 45 minute talk that I gave about this a couple of years ago, specifically on this issue. And the point of this is it's not just a computer programmer in the middle of this world trying to do the right thing. It's the fact that this piece of technology we're building, this problem that we're solving, is a part of a long stream of things that leads up to it and a whole set of things that come after. So the very first thing you have to understand is that you cannot pretend that you are designing and building in isolation. In order to understand that you're not designing and building in isolation, you have to bring into the conversation all of the people who will eventually be affected by what you do downstream. So thinking about what we do, interestingly enough, is computing people as a software engineering enterprise, as a thing that you understand what the outcomes are going to be, the impact they're going to have. You think about the specifications up front and you talk to the people, you have them involved in the design is a crucial thing. Right? We don't do that. We tend not to teach that. We tend not to do it as individuals. It's easier for us to just think about the thing that we're doing, and computing is hardly alone in this. This is something that people in general do, and technologists in particular, uh, particular do, and there are good historical reasons for that. So yes, it needs to be done, and it needs to be done better. One of the reasons that we move the 4001 sequence, the ethics and responsibility courses, from being a required course that nobody took to their last semester first because people put it off until their last semester, and then if people wanted to take it beforehand, it was impossible because you had to let all the graduating seniors in, and so nobody ever got to take it to the end. We made that a prerequisite for junior design, was so that we could have conversations about responsibility and the impact of what it is that you're building, what it is that you're doing, before you start learning how to do design. If you think of equity, if you think of impact, if you think of responsibility, if you think of security, or any of those things, as something that you tack on at the end, you lose. It has to be at the very beginning. As I said earlier, it has to be a part of the very first for loop you ever write. 
So when you ask me how we have to teach that, we have to teach it by making it something that you think about before you ever write your first line of code, that you think about what you're building. That hello world, which seems like something you can, you don't have to worry about anything else. No, you have to think about even hello world and the impact it's gonna have on the world you're saying hello to before you ever write a piece of code. You have to think about it as a large design process. So yes, I believe that that's important. And yes, I believe that we all have to rethink about the way that we teach fundamentally um, computing and computer science and all the related fields so that people are thinking about these things up front. And we're making steps towards that. I think it's difficult to know how to do it right because it's a very large and complicated thing, but I feel very confident that the grading is positive and that we're, we're moving closer and closer to those things. And I don't see any way to avoid trying to tackle that problem if we're going to be as important as I know we're going to be to the future of all uh, development and technology that's going on, whether it's climate change, whether it's you know a slightly faster game, whatever it is you're trying to do, you've got to think about the users and the impact that you're having. So, yes. Did that answer your question or were you leaning more towards equity within diversity of people going into the field? That gets at the I think about predictive policing and mm -hmm. I wish I could remember the name of the software, but there is some software where it's essentially for like pretrial detention. It measures how likely you are to, uh, I guess, jump bond or whatever. Yeah, break parole. Yeah. And the, like, I remember reading an expose on it where it said it would, it said you were like, on a scale of one to 10, you were like three points more likely you violate like the terms of your bond just for being black, all other things about you being equal. And I meant along the, uh, I guess I meant along the lines of how do we, like how does the college create software engineers who don't write code that keeps you in jail for being black? Right, so that was, I was trying to answer that question. Right? It's about thinking about the impact you have on. It is completely true. 38 states use software um, that judges use software and parole boards use software to estimate whether you're going uh, to break parole, um, whether you're going to commit a crime again. And it does turn out that in most of those cases, you're basically just predicting whether somebody is black or not. Which, by the way, is a positive feedback loop. So predictive policing is like this. So if you say, we're gonna put more police here, well, it turns out what police do is they discover crime, right? So you just get into a positive feedback loop, right? Amazon had this problem when they were using um, predictive software to decide who to hire. What the system learned is that they were hiring men. And so they just decided if you're male, you're much more likely to be hired than if you're female, which by the way has the secondary impact of having more males, which means, and if those males do well, well then that was the right thing and it just never ends, right? So when I talk about thinking about the impacts and bringing in everyone who's involved at the beginning, I'm talking exactly about that problem, whether it's hiring on the one end at Amazon, whether it's predictive policing, or whether it's um, estimating the likelihood that someone's going to commit a crime again, how recidivism works, a whole host of things are all about sort of thinking through those consequences. That's a lack of data literacy. Uh, it's a lack of a whole host of things. I'm hoping that three years from now we'll be having a conversation about, or three to five years from now we'll be having a conversation about a joint degree uh, with our good friends at Ivan Allen, talking about implications of computing and law. Not just things like IP, but things about the impact of the computing systems we build on our processes at the level of government and policy, right? There's lots of things like that that should happen, and we should be training people who do the policy to think about what the technology is and to understand it so they can write better policy. So I think that the, the solutions you have to those problems are not just technical solutions. They require an educated citizenry who understand the implications of data science and the systems that you build so they can elect the right people to do whatever they want them to do so that they can enact the right policy that makes sense. So my answer to your question originally was about the computationalists and the technologists, but I actually think it's just as important to educate the non-technologists, the policymaker, the politician, um, the people who are going to be um, studying history, the lawyer, all of these people into understanding how technology works and the implications thereof. So that's a question not just about the Bachelor of Science in Computer Science or Computational Media or Computer Engineering. That's a question about the people who are getting bachelors and masters in public policy, international relations, 
modern languages, whatever. And that's our job is to educate, work with those people to educate them. Is there a question down here, I thought? Yeah, I'll just Well, they won't hear you. We need the mic for the online stream. Sorry. Well, this is really short and I can repeat it. This is a short question. What relationship oh. does the College of Computing going to have with the Space Command, specifically the cyber side of Space Command? Oh, so um, the short answer to that is a strong one. So one of the things that we've been trying very hard to do is to connect with organizations like that. So, you know, the state of Georgia is the home of um, uh, Cyber and Army, I think for Army. Is it Army? Yeah. So we've been trying to build relationships uh, with them for several years. Uh, one of the things we have is Master's of Science in Cybersecurity, for example. We've been trying to connect with those folks to figure out what we can do to educate um, the, the people who are, who are in the armed services in order to have the technological skills that they need to have. We're a part of this. Well, it hasn't come out yet, but Sometime in the next three or four months, if I have my timetable right, there's going to be a big um, report on what the state of Georgia needs to do to be able to educate more and more people in that space. And Georgia Tech is, of course, uh, a lead in that. Um, and that includes, and that this, this specifically is about cybersecurity, but just largely speaking, uh, lots of connections with uh, all the other parts of, of uh, the armed forces and government, generally speaking. And that's not just computing, that's you know the rest of the institute. So this is something we care very much about. We're trying to figure out how to make that work, both as a kind of educational as well as a kind of consulting enterprise, and to think about what not just Georgia Tech, but other universities in the system, and uh, which you know we have 25 sister universities, right? What they can do and how we can partner together to make certain that we can educate that sector. Um, what does uh, Georgia Tech have left to do to become the ranked number one un university for computer science country of the world? So there's a top four. And why is there a top four? Because there's four places tied for number one. So my goal is to create a top five. You don't become number five. You don't even become number one and tied with the other four um, by being like them. You do it by being like you. Each one of the other universities can say something about what they are. You can characterize what they do. I think we are better than anyone in a whole host of things. Our breadth is almost unmatched by any other university in our field. Um, we have led around education. We have led around research. We have led in a whole number of places, including organizations of the way computing ought to be. And I think that we're better at that than anyone. So we continue to be recognized for that. That's the reason why we've moved up in the rankings, right? Because remember, rankings, are purely subjective. It's the, it's the estimation of our peers of how we're doing, right? So because that's how rankings are, you have to convince them that you're interesting and you're doing interesting things. And we've clearly done that because we keep doing this. But the way we get to that last step is we create a top five and people understand that we're better at what we do. What we do is important and we're better at it than anyone else. And I think we're well, well along the way of doing that. I don't, you know, I can think of five other universities that, I think that are as good as we are in their own way, six that are as good as we are in their own way, but none of them are as good as we are in what we do. So we just keep doing that and we keep telling that story. So we are quickly running out of time. There's one more question we haven't answered online and then I have a closing question for you, but um, the question from online is, you know, we're working to address equity in technology, mm -hmm. um, especially from an ethical, responsible computing perspective. But how are we um, increasing equity in diversity of who our students are, um, growing the number of women underrepresented students, and how are we supporting those students? So, uh, so there's at least two questions there. So, um, we enjoy one of the most diverse uh, communities among any uh, in the computing field. It doesn't always feel that way, uh, but it's true, just on, just on the numbers. We're the largest producer, we're the second largest producer of underrepresented PhDs in computer science, for example. We're the largest producer of black undergrads who go on uh, to get a PhD in computer science somewhere. Uh, we, we were, and I don't know if it's still true because this is five or six years ago, we had the largest in both absolute numbers and percentages of uh, 
women faculty, right? We have lots of things that we can brag about um, that we've been able to do, and we've done it by opening the doors. And we admit more and more people, we support them uh, while they're here. So we have to continue to do those things. But even though we can brag about how good we are by comparison, it's only because the bar is so low, right? So what we have to do is stop um, comparing ourselves to the average, um, but say we want to be so far to everyone else that we embarrass everyone else into doing the right thing. Um, and I think the way you do that is you work with the students where they are, you let them know that we're interested in helping them to do well, as opposed to saying no to them. All these things are tied together, right? Your prestige comes from helping people to be the best they can be, not by saying no. And if you can convince people of that, then you can admit all the folks we have. I started this whole conversation off by pointing out that we're probably gonna be in single digits for admission this year. And that's great because it means that lots of people wanna be here. And it's terrible because it means we're gonna say no to 90% of the people who apply. And my guess is at least 70% of them would succeed if they were going to be here. So the way you bring more people in is you allow more people in. There is no pipeline problem with respect to the question you're asking. There's more than enough people who can succeed. The question is whether we invite them in and we support them while they're here. The way we support them while we're here is that we allow people to build the communities they need to build and to build the networks and the connections that they have. You know, I have been the first and the only in many, many situations in my uh, professional career. And the way that I got from there to here is by building a community of people around me who supported me, whether they were faculty, uh, in my college or outside my college, whether they were friends who took classes from me, whether they were people who lived on the uh, other side of the country. I had those conversations with people and they knew I could succeed and I knew that I could succeed. So we have to create that kind of environment where people know that they're here because we know they can succeed and then we give them every opportunity to do so. While on the other hand, they know that they have achieved something by getting through this, that it's not easy but it's well worth it because on the other end, you will know something that very few people in the world know. And I think that that's a crucial fundamental thing uh, for us to do. And the way you do it is by opening up the input and not worrying about getting rid of them before they get out. They will be fine and they will do us proud. So just to close this out, we talked about growth of enrollment, number of alumni that were producing that kind of thing at the beginning. We're sitting in a room that when I was in school was a parking lot. When you were in school, I, I don't know. We didn't, we didn't have cars. <laughs> it may have been grass. Um, when we look out the window in your office, the skyline has changed drastically in Atlanta, especially right here in Midtown over in, you know, just across the bridge that way um, on Spring Street and Peachtree, one of the Peachtrees. What's next? What do you hope is happening here in Atlanta, but also what is Georgia Tech's role in the College of Computing's role and what's next? So, you know, it's all changing around us and it's changing very quickly. The reason I think about the 49% of alum is because it's exponential. But the thing is, it's all exponential. The number of people coming to Atlanta is growing exponentially. The number of tech companies who are showing up is growing and growing and growing. This is a thing that, you know, you're all computationalists. You know what happens when you have exponential growth and you have linear solutions. Nothing works, right? So the only way that we're going to be able to absorb what's happening, the only way we're going to be able to move forward is by having non-linear solutions. And so Georgia Tech has to be the center of our, of our non-linear solutions. We have to come up with new creative ideas that give us discontinuities and move us to the next level. We can't just go, well, we're going to keep doing the same thing we're doing, but just 3% faster next year. You've got to kind of, you've got to jump ahead and you've got to take some calculated risks to get you there. I know that when I look out of my office on the third floor of CCB and I see the new Google building, I see NCR, and if I lean, I can see where Microsoft is, is going to be soon. Um, that they're there because this city is an amazing place to be, this part of the country is an amazing place to be. We have Georgia Tech, we have Georgia State, we have an entire ecosystem uh, of people and they want that talent. So Georgia Tech's role per force is going to be central in those conversations uh, because we're the place where people are coming for tech talent and where people from all over the world want to be uh, in order to, to take advantage take advantage of those opportunities. So what we have to do, and in some ways this answers the question of how you get to number one, 
is you have to accept the mantle of leadership, recognize the responsibility that comes with it, and take appropriate, op bold steps in order to move forward, period. If you don't do that, if you're timid, you lose. You get to number eight and you go, I don't have to go any higher because I'm too scared of becoming number nine or number 10. Instead, you say, I'm going to be number one through leadership and by being best at what we do, and that we're gonna take those chances. What's important, and this goes back to the question the gentleman in the back asked, is that you have to do that in a way that doesn't involve you giving up who you fundamentally are. We're still gonna be Georgia Tech at the end of the day, and even though I, I see things have changed dramatically, this building wasn't here, as you said, we didn't have any, the CRC didn't look anything like it looked like when I was here, everything is, is very different. At the end of the day, you know, we're still, uh, we're still teaching people uh, how to tread water uh, for 20 minutes without drowning. We're still drown-proofing fundamentally. That's what, what Georgia Tech is. We teach people how much they can accomplish when they're pushed uh, without breaking, right? And that's who we are, and that's how we're separate from so many other places. We have to keep being that, and we have to keep living up to progress and service. We have to keep doing all the things that we have been doing so well for the last 40 or 50 years and just take it to the next level. And tech is gonna be in the middle of those conversations. The last thing I will say on this, before we close, is that I can sit here and say all these things all day, which I have done, and I will continue to do, uh, and I can tell you this, and I can tell the people out there this as well, but that 49% of alum who graduated in the last five years, the 51 or 52% will have graduated in the last five years next year, it's really gonna be about y'all, giving back, providing mentorship, having the impact in the world. So. My goal in having this impact is to make certain that the great community that Georgia Tech has produced, the great community that College of Computing has produced, continues to take seriously progress and service, continues to take seriously the lessons that they've learned here, and has that impact on the world, and helps each other to, to have further impact on the world. And if we do that, we'll all wake up one day. I'll retire, and I'll feel good about where we ended up, because the community came together and did something. And I really believe that, and I really know that we can do it together. Let's hope we also solve the problem of exponential growth in traffic. No, here that's, in Atlanta. That, that's not a solvable problem. We'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll solve something else first. Well, thank you, Charles, for taking time out of your day to talk. Thank you to everyone who is here with us live and those of you joining us on live for this conversation. We hope to see you all back on campus very soon, or as Charles and I hit the road again in just a few weeks, we hope to see you in your cities. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much, and go Jackets. Thank you.